Today's the first week of your uh, Christmas sermon series titled Hope Has Come. And uh, as, as has been mentioned, we'll be looking at Isaiah 53, one of the most well-known and explicitly messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. You can go to the next slide. Uh, before we get to that, however, I wanted to talk a little bit about the concept of hope itself. Hope's obviously a massive massively important concept <clears throat> after all it's listed in 1 corinthians chapter 13 verse 13 as one of three things that will last forever the other two being faith and love the bible has a lot of verses about each of these three theological virtues they're known as what i find interesting however is that the Bible has specific verses defining both faith and love, but none for hope. Amongst the many verses referencing hope in the Bible, none of them explicitly explain what it means. And I don't know about you, but I find that I struggle to define it myself in a way that I'm happy with. When I don't know what a word means, I like to go to the dictionary. Revolutionary. We go to the dictionary to see what the commonly held meanings are. The dictionary defines hope in a few different ways. Here are a few of them. The feeling that, that what is wanted can be had, or that events will turn out for the best. Another one to look forward to with desire and reasonable confidence. Third one, to believe, desire, or trust. And then one last one, to feel that something desired may happen. Now, now if we read some of these definitions, it can easily make us think of faith. Reasonable confidence, to believe and trust, etc. These are definitely words and ideas that we would use to describe faith. So there seems to be a bit of crossover between hope and faith. Even in the, the verse in the Bible that explicitly defines faith in Hebrews, it talks about now, now faith is the evidence of things hoped for, um, or the assurance of things hoped for. So even in the faith definition verse, hope is included in the definition. So there's a bit of crossover, but what differentiates hope from faith? Why is hope deserving of its own spot in the big three? Now we'll look to answer that question, but first let us get to the passage this morning. So Isaiah, if you're not aware, is one of the major prophets in the Old Testament, and his book is actually the second most quoted Old Testament book in the New Testament, only behind the book of Psalms. So we know that Isaiah must have had a lot to say about the gospel and about Christ, since that was what the New Testament authors were focused on writing about. Isaiah has four passages about a particular man known as the suffering servant. Together these passages are known as the servant songs. And they're found in chapters 42, 49, 50, and the last one is 52 and 53. Each of these four servant songs describes Christ. And the final one is one that we're looking at today. So let's begin reading from verse 1 of chapter 53, and we're doing the whole chapter. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. 
He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin... He will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. <clears throat> what an incredible passage, and I think it was brilliant that we did communion today as well. This was written 700 odd years before Jesus would enter the world as a baby boy. Isaiah laid out his entire earthly life for us in this passage. Let's go from the top. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Verse 1. This is an acknowledgement that Israel did not understand God's redemptive plan during Isaiah's day when he wrote this, and they would not understand it during Jesus' time on earth either. Then in verse 2 it says of Jesus, He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. The first section of verse 2 might be easily overlooked for what follows, but I think it's extremely important. Jesus grew up like a root out of dry ground. There was nothing special about the situation that Jesus entered the world through. It was the equivalent of dry ground. Nothing special about Mary or Joseph, apart from a willingness to obey God. Sure, both Mary and Joseph were in in the line of David, King David. But by that time, it didn't mean very much at all. Israel was occupied by Rome. They didn't have a king, and they never would again. It says something that Jesus would be prophesied to be born in the line of David, but that he would arrive once that no longer meant anything. It wouldn't have any political impact. God chose to send Jesus into the world as a nobody. His birth was attended to by foreigners and shepherds. I like to think that A modern day equivalent of a shepherd is a trolley collector. At least in terms of the lack of prestige in their positions. The very idea of angels going to the shepherds is kind of laughable when you understand how shepherds were viewed. They were on the lowest rung of society. And instead of going to the kings or the, the religious leaders, they went to these un, untrustworthy kids looking after sheep. That's how God operates, though. That's how he's always operated. The second half of verse 2 tells us that Jesus had no beauty or majesty to attract people to him. Nothing in his physical appearance that anyone would desire him. I love that. And if there's one area where I can say I'm Christ-like, it's, it's, it's in that area. 
Exodus tells us that Moses was a great looking baby, very attractive baby. King Saul was noted as handsome and tall. King David's good looks were also noted in the Bible. But Jesus looked completely unremarkable. His ministry wouldn't be built on his ability to look good in a robe and sandals or to, or to attract people with natural charisma. If, he, if Jesus had come to earth today, he would never have been able to make it as a motivational speaker or a social media influencer. Verse 3 tells us that Jesus was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. People hid their faces from him. They despised him and held him in low esteem. Jesus' life was characterized by suffering and pain. Despite that, in verses 4 to 7, the passage tells us how Jesus took the punishment we deserved. He took up our pain and bore our suffering. He was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that made us right with God was brought upon him and it was his wounds that healed us. Jesus had the sin of all of God's wayward creation laid on him. He was oppressed and afflicted but remained silent. He was led to the slaughter like a common criminal despite living a perfect life. Then further on in verse 10, we read that it was God's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. God decided that he would take the punishment in place of his own creation. In the end of verse 12, it says that Jesus bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. While Jesus was being attacked by those who were preparing him to die, he was praying to his Father in heaven to forgive his persecutors. While Jesus hung up on that cross, dying, he reached out and saved the soul of one of the other criminals on a nearby cross. Isaiah 53 is the most amazing prophecy of Christ's life and death and of the reason he suffered as he did. And suffer he certainly did. Jesus' life here on earth was full of conflict and confrontation. He had no earthly security, no home, no place to lay his head. He had to trust God to provide for all of his needs because he wouldn't have had much money of his own. He lived the life of a traveling teacher, either rejected violently or embraced so forcefully as to exhaust him with demands on his time, energy, and gifts. The Gospels note Jesus weeping in multiple instances. It never notes him laughing. The life Jesus lived was not the type of life that the world tells us we should aspire towards, happiness and hedonism. The world tells us that we should do whatever we want as long as no one gets hurt. But Jesus tells us in Matthew 5 that blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. Blessed are those who get insulted and lied about. I'm not sure how many of us really feel blessed we're in the, when we are in those situations. Why are we blessed when we suffer? Because we have something better than happiness and hedonism. We have hope. Hope that the suffering Jesus endured on our behalf has made a way for us to be with God. Hope of an eternity in our true home with our Father in heaven. Hope that God is with us now, guiding and protecting us, making all things work together for those who love God and accord according to his purposes. And hope that he will complete the good work that he started within us, saving our souls and transforming us into the likeness of his son Jesus. 
I think I've, I've mentioned this uh, in bits and pieces in the past when I've come and preached, but a couple of years back, I went through a period in my relationship with God where I was full of doubt and devoid of hope. Over the course of a few years, uh, my, my grandfather had passed away and I conducted his funeral. In the midst of that, I was falsely accused of something horrible by a family member. Um, then shortly after that, my relationship with my wife's family broke down. Uh, one of my closest friends attempted to end his own life and uh, thankfully he was not successful, but he moved away right after that, meaning that I, I lost him as a friend. My sister-in-law's husband suddenly passed away after only two months of marriage, leaving my sister-in-law a widow at the age of 22. I, I conduct, shortly after that, I conducted a funeral for a 22-year-old who had ended her own life. And then the next year, my wife miscarried. I'd been put through the ringer, and the miscarriage was the final straw. I started doubting in God's goodness. <laughs> so the old question, how could a good God allow so much suffering to happen? So much pain. How could he just let it all happen? I knew all the theological answers to that question. Like, uh, that's, it's a result of our fallen, fallen world. It's a sin nature. Um, the idea that, well, if, if he eliminated some sin, why not all sin? That would mean eliminating us. And those are, those are true. But they weren't any help at all to me at the time. When I was in the midst of questioning my own suffering, these theological arguments didn't help. So I began to doubt God's goodness. And I kept it a secret from my wife and everyone else I knew um, because I didn't want to burden my wife with anything else. She was already going through enough. She, she, we were still processing and grieving the miscarriage. And I didn't talk about it with anyone else because I didn't want to influence anyone away from God. But in my own heart, I felt like I might be done. So I carried this for a few months. And then one night I came across a book by C.S. Lewis called A Grief Observed, which was a book he wrote after his wife passed away due to cancer. The book was more a collection of journal entries, half devoted to processing not having his wife in his life any longer, and the other half of it was venting his anger at God for not healing her. And as I read his words accusing God of all this terrible stuff, I felt vindicated in my own anger towards God, my own doubt. But then, at one point in the book, C.S. Lewis uh, turned the magnifying glass off God and onto himself. And he described his, his own faith as nothing more than a house of cards blown over by the first stiff breeze. And I had to admit that my faith was the same. His book had gone from vindicating me to convicting me. C.S. Lewis didn't try to give any answers for why there is so much suffering in the world, but he gave me a challenge. Make the choice. Do you trust God or not? Do you have faith or not? Are you a Christian or are you not? Can you follow God even if you don't understand? And praise be to God. Because in that moment the answer I found was yes. Reading that book had humbled me 
and it brought me to a place of repentance. And after that experience, even though nothing externally had changed about my situation, I found a hope in life that I had not had for years. My faith came alive again and was stronger than it was even before all of my suffering began. Now, have I found the answer for why God allows so much suffering and evil to flourish in this world? De definitely not. I don't understand, and it's something that I still wrestle with, something I still struggle with. But I'm reminded that I've got three kids, and two of them are old enough to ask me questions. And occasionally they'll ask me a question that's a legitimate question, but I know that they're not yet capable of understanding the answer. And I wonder, wonder if why God allows suffering is one of those questions that humans are smart enough to conceive, but not smart enough to comprehend the answer. Maybe it's just beyond us. Regardless, I can trust God. Why can I trust him? Is it just irrational, blind trust? No. I can trust God because Jesus suffered more than I could ever imagine just to provide a way for me to be a part of God's family. Rather than just sitting back from afar and passively watching the suffering happening, God immersed himself in that suffering, took that suffering on to enact his redemptive plan. If God was willing to suffer the greatest amount that will ever be suffered in order to reach his goal. I can trust him that even though I don't understand how or why, I know that it will all be worth it in the end. All of the suffering will be worth it in the end because it was worth it for God to suffer for us it will all make sense in the end I have hope that one day I'll understand and that God will be proved right in his conduct I want to finish with another passage from Romans Romans 5 verses 1 to 5 therefore since we have been justified through faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character. And character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Suffering can produce hope in us. If we keep our eyes fixed on God and his redemptive plan, Jesus coming to earth as a baby, growing up and taking the punishment for our sin that we each deserved, that is the reason for our hope. Near the start of the message, I spoke about what makes hope different to faith. The answer is found in, in those definitions. Each of the definitions use the word desire. Hope is a desire for, not just an acknowledgement of or belief in. The early Christians... When they, when they would greet each other, they would say, Maranatha. Maranatha means, come, O Lord. It was an expression of their heartfelt desire for the return of Christ. Hope is a reflection of the desires of our heart. 
And I want to challenge us all this morning. What are we hoping for? Does our heart yearn for Christ and to know him more? Or are we more caught up with what the world tells us we should be chasing? Are we living for happiness and hedonism? Or are we living with hope in Christ? Let's choose hope. Because it's so much better than anything the world can offer. Let me pray. Lord, thank you that you took all of our sin on yourself and suffered all the punishment that we deserved just so that we could be with you. Thank you that you suffered more than any of us could ever imagine. Just coming as a man was just an extreme suffering, an extreme humiliation for the God of the universe. But you did it for us. Thank you, God. Thank you that even though I don't understand why things happen the way they do, thank you that you, you haven't just stood back and watched. You've joined us in the suffering. You've suffered on our behalf. And because of that, I know I can trust you, God. Lord, help me to help us all to keep trusting you when the hard times come. Well, thank you that doubt isn't, isn't fatal. <laughs> thank you that you, you don't abandon us, that you're faithful to us even when we aren't faithful to you. And I pray, Lord, that you would give us hope and that we, we could live with that hope in mind and in our hearts always. Lord, help us to keep our eyes fixed on you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.